get started. All right, so everybody, welcome to uh, the second part of uh, my little totally subjective Cosine 2020 review. Um, we did mostly some of the conference stuff and the posters yesterday and took a brief list of this wonderful list of PIs who were talking. And so I'm just going to curate a little bit uh, what we're going to take a look at because, of course, we can't take a look at all of this, at least not sort of in one sitting. Um, and I really want to start with a thing they call the sweep. Uh, so Edward Moser was there and he gave a talk. Um, uh, so he, he was talking about the fact that um, sort of what about networks of uh, head direction cells? Um, like we've in recorded individual um, um, head direction cells and some of them are theta modulated and some are not and some of them are very sharp, particularly the ones in, what is it, pre Um and others have like very broad tuning. And so what they endeavored to do with uh, work that was done by Richard Gardner um, is to just record a whole heck of like head direction cells. So they use neuropixel probes, you know, these new high density, very volatile um, uh, recording probes and recorded something like 400 head direction cells. It's kind of cool. We're talking like these giant numbers now. It used to be like that we're happy to have uh, you know, five or eight. Oh, we can do some statistics. I have more than 10. Um, nowadays, we're talking hundreds. And so um, of, so there's lots of head direction cells you can find, and they neatly track uh, head directions. But the tuning in media anterior cortex seems to be much broader, unlike those in the subiculum, which tend to be very sharp. And then they took a look at the temporal analysis. And as I mentioned, some of those are theta modulated, and some are not. And it's quite interesting what happens when you filter for the theta modulated ones. Um, and it kind of explains why they are so broad. Um, I'm just going to show you guys a video. It's just to say, what exactly do you mean by theta modulated? Exactly what is so their firing is modulated by theta. So it has some phase relationship to theta. Just saying the individual spikes are occurring on theta, theta uh, peaks, is that what you mean? Uh, not necessarily theta peaks, but they have some relationship to, to theta. I mean, modulated is a broad term, right? It can mean any, any kind of relationship that is non-random. That's, that's what I was trying to get clarity on. What does it mean right. to be modulated by theta? Right. I, I can't tell you more precisely because you know, he didn't describe it more precisely. Obviously, I, I want to know now. Uh, there's a manuscript in the work uh, that is going to come out. So uh, Richard Gardner together with the Moses, as you can see here. Um, so I, I can probably answer that when that paper comes out. Um, but what I want to show you is what happens when you decode from these cells. Uh, because it turns out that much of the broad tuning of these theta modulated head direction cells actually has to do with the fact that these head direction cells are not really, um, how shall we say? They're not really sharp into the head direction. They do something else. I'm just going to play the video and let you guys be amazed. So you have like simultaneous decoding here of grid cells, right, in red, and the head direction cells, which you can kind of see sweeping here, like veering alternatingly like left and right of the head direction. It's almost like the rodent is like probing future directions to walk, like where to head to. There's also a, a link with the grid cells. You can see that the grid cells like sort of like tend to light up and then the head direction <laughs> cells why, goes why, why are these called head direction cells if they're not representing the direction of the head? That's a really good question. So they probably need a new term for that. Okay, so these would not be classic head direction cells. These are, these are not classic head direction. I mean, yeah, if you do the time average, if you do the time average, right, if you don't look at theta, if you don't filter for that, they will just look like very broadly tuned head direction cells. Because it turns out, as you can see from the video here, it's sort of like always pinging left and right of the head direction. Yeah, so I wouldn't call it head direction cells at all. And, and again, I'm not sure what it means to be tied to theta because we haven't been able to describe that. So, so I look at the cells and I would say, well, you might say they average out to the head direction. They're clear not head direction cells. Uh, right. There's something something quite else, right? 
and and given how you can see when the rodent is like going towards the wall that the sweeping will not go into the wall so it's not just tapping left and right it's more like probing you know possible walk directions so this like might be very exciting for people like david Terrell. there you can see right uh, who are thinking of these uh, theta sequences as um, sort of probing future trajectories um, and think of this in so, sort of like a, as one part of a hierarchical navigational planning um, system of sorts. Well, they look so like, each, it would look like they're uh, what the animal is attending to or think, you know, like, oh, should I go this way, should I go that way? Just like you and I would attend to yeah. things if we we're moving along. Yeah, but they're very strictly rhythmic, right? You can see, I mean, like you can see the time index above. So this whole video is slowed down by, I don't know, a factor of four or something. And so what is like 125 millisecond um, theta interval in real time is like half a second here. So you see about like two of these sweeps per second. Did you say that these are ones in entorhinal cortex? Did you say where these are? Yeah, there's media anterior cortex head direction cells. So, and is this all of the so-called uh, medial anterior head direction cells, or are they cherry picking the ones that did this? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, they looked for the ones that are theta modulated and have head direction tuning, and then it turns out, well, they're not really head direction cells, right? As as um, as uh, Jeff just said. You know, we had this idea that we came across once. Uh, uh, it was related to like five cells in the cortex, but the idea was that it seems like the cortex has to do multiple things at the same time. It, it has to sort of process the current input, and then it also has to imagine future inputs. And 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 you really can't do those at the same time. Um, and so we had problems with this of the sequence memory. And so one of the ideas was that it oscillates between um, the sort of current sensation and uh, uh, imagining a predicted future. Um, and so this idea that you're showing here is consistent with that. If, if we were to say that these cells are spiking on every, you know, once a theta cycle, like you said five, I, I didn't know if the numbers, I couldn't follow the numbers that worked out that was once per peak of a theta cycle. But um, the idea that they were alternating, you know, that a column in the cortex alternates between imagining the future and, um, and actually, you know, uh, what is currently processing. And it, it seems somewhat remotely consistent with that idea. It'd be interesting <clears throat> to see whether, uh, I mean, I don't know how you could reliably get it uh, given that test setup, but to see what direction, what the gaze direction was, you know, whether the the uh, uh, rat's eyes are, are, are cicading left and right in correlation with uh, where these little probes are going. Yeah, I mean, that would be fascinating, right? But as far as, I mean, like, I think if that was true, that like, you know, rodents are like also looking theta rhythmically, I mean, it would be pretty fast signal, right? Like, you have to keep in mind, this is not real time, right? This is like a factor of four or so from, from real time. Like this whole thing plays a lot faster. You can see the time index above here, right? So like, we are at five, two, three, four, six. Right, so it's something like you know, factor of five or so against reality, and that's why, if it, like if the theta rhythm, which is 125 milliseconds, so that would essentially mean that you see, you know, like a sweep here every half second, which is kind of what you do. Like you see, if you count from sweep to sweep, like two two sweeps are kind of a second. Yeah, it's it's inconsistent with. I mean, the whole idea of doing these sort of oscillating back and forth. Uh, is inconsistent with the uh, ability to move your eyes. I'm not even sure mice or rat even saccad like we do. Yeah. I don't think we do. But it could be it could be an internal processing thing. That's what I was arguing, Kevin. It's more of an internal thing where it, it just alternates rapidly between two different representations. Um, and you're not consciously aware of it. Um, and we, we kind of concluded that the sequence memory had to do this. And we never incorporated it, but it was sort of one of these like hard to believe things that you, the brain could be oscillating back and forth between two different representations but sort of that was the only um the only way we could imagine it but it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a slow physical thing it would be very fast mm -hmm. one thing that i was also quite puzzled by in in this video is that you can see if you look closely if you look at the d uh, the grid cell decoding right i mean you see like the the red shading here right 
that somehow the, the head direction cell tends to sort of sweep towards the, those grid cell activations. I don't know exactly like the, the timing of these decoders and you know how exactly this is, so I, I won't make any causal claims. But the idea is, of course, that these theta uh, awake you know, sequences, right? They would sweep a path, and so you would potentially get like locked grid cell, you know, replay with that. There's this um, this this uh, paper that I'm currently reading on the activity of grid cells during during replay, um, which might have something to say about this. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, I, I noticed that too. That that it, it wasn't 100 percent consistent in the video. It wasn't like every yeah. time that little sweep thing showed up as a pointing towards. Yeah. The I mean, if you just like focus on the um, on the on the on the grid cells, right? And you just put your gaze there, you kind of see like whenever you are done focusing on it, like there's the sweep reaching for it. You know, this also is interesting in the sense that when we looked at grid cell uh, responses, like the original recordings, um, they weren't always consistent, right? It was like it's very scattered. It's like sometimes the cell fires, sometimes the cell doesn't fire in this region. And it always bothered me. It wasn't like this is a very precise thing. It's like, and it's almost like random. And when, but it's, it's not random where it occurs, it's random if it occurs at any point. You know, it's like, yes, it represents some location, but it's not always firing when you're at the location. So the idea that it actually might be modulated by an attentional mechanism like this is very interesting that mm -hmm. the two things are tied together. The grid cell fires when you attend to the spot or that you attend to the spot. You know, there, it's, it's part, the whole thing could be part of an attentional mechanism. That is consistent with the grid cells pointing in the head direction, and I mean the head direction cells sort of generally pointing in the head direction. The grid cells representing location, but only when there's so sort of a coincident activity, which is what this suggests. Mm. It's also quite striking to me that it's really alternating right, left, right, left, right, left. I mean, there's some some deviation in that, but it's generally true if you just watch the video. It's like right, left, right, left of head, right, left, right, left, right, left. Right, left. Yeah, sometimes right. it's not it always going right. like that, right? It's not always. There's a few in there that didn't do that. So again, that would be consistent with an attentional signal. Like normally, yes, if you're walking down a hallway, you might be attending to the left, attending to the right, or not even a saccade. I'm just saying mentally. Uh, mm -hmm. But if there was something interesting on one side, you might attend more to that one side. So I, mm -hmm. I, I saw that same pattern. I, I interpreted it as not like as a rhythmic back and left, left and right. It was more like that would be a normal attentional sort of a scan. Um, uh, and which would often look like left right. Yeah, maybe. So, I'm, I'm, I don't know about time scales here, right? I mean, it's like eight times a second, right? No, but, I'm so, saying, these are subconscious um, processes. That's what I keep trying to emphasize. You're saying very rapidly happening that you wouldn't be aware. Yeah, um, covert attention works much faster than isocod, so it can easily work at 150 millisecond time frame. Mm. So, so I recently oh, yeah, it's found actually going to be more on covert attention. Actually, it was uh, also some very interesting data by, uh, was it? Um, let me get out of here. Um, oh yeah, Beth Beth Buffalo talked about like covert visual attention and whatnot. But we 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 get to that. So I recently sent out a paper uh, from that finally came out from Lauren Frank's lab uh, about place cells doing something very similar to this. When a rat arrives at the decision point on a track, uh, it sweeps alternating mm -hmm. theta cycles, which this looks a lot like theta cycles if it's eight times per second. Uh, yeah. Alternate theta cycles is left, right, left, right. I, like, I'm like. i guessing plenty of people who are at this meeting were all thinking the same thing. That or, like the, what these are- Could you explain that? that? I'm sorry, could you explain it? What you're saying alternating left and right, like, like a place cell there would be like two play cells and one would fire, then the other one would fire, one would be on the left and one would be on the right. Is that what you meant? Right. Uh, so, so imagine a, um, a rat and a rat reaches a fork in a T maze and it's deciding whether to go left or right. Uh, there are play cells that has tuned to both of those, uh, to locations on the left track and locations on the right track. Uh, and when the rat arrives at the, like the center point between these, um, the the place cells for the left part of the track fire, then the place cells for the right, then left, then right, alternating on theta cycles, uh, left, right, left, right, then the rat decides and it takes one of the tracks. Uh, That's fascinating. It, yeah, it looks just like what's going on here exactly. It's exactly this. Like, it, and it, the timing looks exactly like it. It, it seems almost very high chance to do the same thing. Wow, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know if you remember, I showed a video uh, a year or two ago about decoding place cells uh, while a rat is in a maze. And what happens often is the place cell follows the rat, and then when it's at a decision point, it will think through. You can decode the place cells, even though the rat is not moving, it'll fire at multiple different trajectories. It'll follow these other trajectories, and then the very last trajectory, basically, that was shown, once the animal starts moving again, the place cells will now follow that. So it's almost like it's planning out multiple paths, very similar to, you know, path planning kind of algorithm might might do. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, Jeff, I like I, I like what you pointed out that uh, that this could be like an underlying principle of why grid cells are often so noisy. Uh, maybe they're they're kind of. Yeah, when you average across the multiple minutes, you see that you, you miss these kinds of effects. Yeah, I mean, you, you just you just point out the place cells do that, and so we place that too. And to, you know, the whole point here, the place cells and grid cells are paired together, and so it's like you're you're imagining different locations and different um, uh, different things at those locations. But again, when I say the word imagining, this is happening too fast for you to be sort of mentally consciously aware of it. It's it's, it's just cycling through these possibilities. Um, um, it's very rapidly, which is fascinating. I mean, it makes total, other... makes total sense to me. I mean, if you have a really good location code for or a map of your environment and a prediction of where, what you will do as you move around, you would want to use that for planning. Um, and it makes total sense to me. And it, it, the fact that it can happen so fast subconsciously is is really interesting. Yeah. Another thing I think about, you know, one of the, this is a, a bumping it up a, a bit, just sort of more abstractly. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, about unions as a way of representing uncertainty, and we know that unions are limited. Um, but this is essentially solving a, a, a similar type of problem, but doing it very rapidly, sequentially. Uh, instead of just trying to resolve a bunch of uh, unknowns at once, you can just cycle through them really quickly <laughs> and see what, and unconsciously, and then see which one works out. It's just it's sort of a different mechanism. One one quick other thing I'll point out real quick is uh, that. An interesting thing with head direction cells is um, the good ones, the ones that don't do this, the ones that uh, that that are more traditional head direction cells, uh, the, pr probably the ones in subiculum. Um, they're some of the most reliable neurons in the brain. Uh, when you when you see live recordings of like a rat walking around with a really good head direction cell, the head direction cell is so reliable. It's just uh, no firing, no firing, no firing, pop 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 pop, no firing, no firing. Like, uh, and normally you don't expect that from neurons in the brain, but head direction cells are super reliable. So it's interesting to see these ones that are not following. Them. Yeah, that's why I think it's, it's unfortunate to call these sort of head direction cells that are modulated because that could really f mess us up, right? Because they're really not head direction cells. They're maybe attentionally direction cells or something like that. And um, so the nomenclature could be confusing here. I mean, it's it's interesting that the non-modulated head direction cells are a lot sharper, and always face the actual head direction. Yeah, that's what's right. so they they seem to want to divide the, the the cells now in two groups. I wonder, are there are there grid cells that are like those really finely tuned head direction cells? Are there grid cells that are always reliable firing at some location? Or are they more of this sort of, you know, the, the noisy looking ones? Do, do, yeah. Does anyone know? I don't know. I haven't seen anyone talk about really, really, really good grid cells, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so, you know, because the funny thing is, I, you know, we, as we briefly mentioned on Monday, you know, I started thinking about this hypothesis that there really aren't grid cells. The grid cells are a manifestation of something else when you project it onto a 2D plane. And um, and so it, it may be, it just may be the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, uh, and, and so where it's it, this evidence that there are strict head direction cells that really are reliable, it's a very, very important observation, but maybe this, and so that makes you think, okay, they really do exist, but maybe the grid cells don't really exist. It's it's a it's a, it's a manifestation of something else, and we're just looking at it through some of the lens. All right, um, I kind of want to move on. Uh, there's one more thing that we like um, was talking about, like after that fascinating sweep thing, which like stuck on my mind, which was of course uh, there's interesting questions about the continuous attractor neural network um, topologies. So like these ideal models that don't struggle with the with these boundary effects that 
like we talked about with the, the, the Ilafit paper, right, have like perfect toroidal connectivity. And to me, that always seemed like a stretch in terms of neuroanatomy. Um, and so interesting questions, of course, you know, like how would one, you know, like defeat that idea or like, or, or verify it. And very high dense recordings actually open, open up a new idea to this. So one of the things you can do is of course, besides sort of like this early evidence from persistent homology and early decoding attempts is to just do a dense recording and then do things like running in the absence of uh, like placer inputs, like landmarks. So like running in the dark, for example, and it's very interesting when you let rodents like run in the dark on like like these VR you know environments. Um, it seems to be that like these these large density recordings seems to show that the network is kind of running sequentially like through all of its cells, um, like to the point that you can sort of like plot you know big subgroups and you see like essentially like these waves that are running through the whole network. And it takes a lot of time. It takes like like ten seconds or something to run through through that whole thing. But that is kind of what you would expect if you were to run at a slight angle through a toroidal network, because you could go around around in a circle and like you know would drift in the other direction, right? Your second uh, axis. And so, but after some time, you would come back to where you are. And we know that the number of cells uh, are quite limited, right? We talked about the constraints uh, that you know David Tank revealed. Uh, you know, in the sort of uh, more anatomical uh, recording, uh, like on the on the surface sheet and like looking at the cells with with two foot on calcium rather than uh, electrophysiology, right? Um, so so there was some interesting discussion uh, about that. I don't think like we we uh, re resolved that, and it also seems to be a little bit weird that while that running through like these populations tends to be linked to running, sometimes it continues a little bit after stopping. So like there's something a little bit odd, like the, you know, I mean, like, like the rodent is imagining still running or something. It can't tell because it's dark. Like it's a bit weird. It's also unidirectional, uh, monotonic and, you know, broadly explained by moving behavior, but not entirely. How long, so does, that like, hmm? How long does that last? That continuing effect? Um, I, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I saw some plots, but sadly, I would have loved to like show these to you, but I didn't take a picture of that. You know, it made so, me remind me, it reminded me of the, the waterfall effect. Uh, you know what that is? You, you look out the back window of a car as you're driving. And when the car stops, it still looks like the, the things are receding from you for a few seconds. Oh, I see. I wonder, I wonder if it was just more of a sort of a, a physiological... Uh, After effect of sorts, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, anyways, I just wanted to mention that because it was also part of this. Um, next, I, I kind of want to leave it up to you. So, which direction we can go? So, one direction is to now take it to two cool experimental studies. One is the scaling up of environments uh, that Caswell Barry did, right? Just noting this, like what happens actually when we double room size, you know, again and again and again. Um, and the and the flying bats of uh, Ulanovsky. Or alternatively, we talk a bit more about grid cell play cell interactions. So that would, you know, be a little bit more theoretical. Uh, so that would be Dory Derek Mann, um, you know, Burak, Kentros, and maybe some of Neil Burgess' work. Um, you know, we can do all of that, but I leave it up to you to decide. I have a preference, but I don't want to dominate here. So <laughs> does anyone else have a preference? I vote flying bats. <laughs> the 3D one. Let's go. All right. Anyone else? Okay, of those three, I mm -hmm. would I place the scale up first, then flying bats. All right, cool. Then let's do the two experimental ones first. We can do um, either so one. scaling up. Um Barry Caswell gave a talk about this this thing of course that like wild rats are running um you know uh, thousands of meters whereas our lab rats are always in like these little little boxes with um with a meter or two in diameter so how how sure are we really of of all of the things that we are saying right um let me just quickly see if i find the uh, notes from this talk. Face, uh, uh, just an objection ready to the way the problem was posed 
I think rats need, rats need to do both. It's not like one's realistic and one's not realistic. Right. Like, right. You know, what I'm what I'm finding my way around in my in my closet, I have to have very accurately be able to you know reach out even in the dark, reach out and open a drawer and and where's my you know where's the the phone on the counter and things like that. But then also I have to do very large scale environments too. So you need to do this accurately in both and, and even. Very small in the cortex, we have to do very small environments. You're manipulating your phone. Um, you know, you need a reference frame that's just as big as your phone. You don't need anything bigger than that. So I think it needs to do both. It's not like one's realistic and one's not realistic. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but the question is, of course, what happens to these spatial representations, right, at these different scales? And so what they did here is essentially they had like a like a small room. That's the, the A environment. And then they doubled that to have a B environment. And then they doubled that for a C environment. And then they doubled that again for like a, a, a D environment. And so there's a um, like total of like three doubling steps here. And so that it becomes a big environment. They need like four cameras. And of course, they you know, need like you know, giant arms to like do the random food drops, right? To keep the rodents moving to explore this big environment. Because of course, if you want to understand what's happening to the map here, you need to actually get some good coverage, right? Uh, and that's the way we like we typically motivate the rodents to, to to move, right? And so they typically took like three days to get good coverage of the of the floor to have like you know a, a good map that you can then analyze. And then were you, were you saying were... the rat the took three days to learn it, or they had to do the experiment for three days and get all the data? Well, that if if you record it from the rats uh, after three days, you would have good coverage coverage that you would you know be confident in what you're saying about the place cells and the grid. So cells. that sounds to me more like it's not the rat takes three days. That sounds like they need enough data, which to right. I will also talk. There's there was also um, a, a different talk about um, about the real time formation of map maps. There was uh, Julia Krupic. Uh, we can totally get into that too. Uh, but yeah, this is not what that is about. It's it's about like you know how much do they have to run around until our decoders are are are, are sure that, that they've seen all the spaces and and understand. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that it takes that long for the places and the the grid cells to stabilize. That's a different question, of course. Yes. Um, so when you double environments like this, um, in so yeah, um, so this is work by Sandatami, and these are just uh, like tetrodes and CA1, uh, looking at the at the at the place cells, um, and so um, so unlike like these experiments where they like slowly move borders, you know, where like you can see these stretching effects. When you double environments like this, there's a like a complete remapping, so it's not like it just continues out. Um, there's like literally like a like a like a new map every time, um, and so it's treated like a new environment. Uh, isn't it true that the the way the picture shows it there that when they go from A to B, that the rat is now in a completely new space? It's not even overlapping with that, right? They they, they they yeah. Actually, in this case, it's not even it's overlapping. It's not like they move yeah. the wall and make the room twice as big. They basically right. just do in a separate room that's twice. Yeah, big. I mean, from C to D, it would be overlapping, right? Yeah, well, that's an important distinction right. whether the rat feels like it's in the same spot or not. It's a very different uh, uh, effect. Right. So we have to be careful. So they're trying to measure different things here. They are measuring the number of place cells, so the number of uh, place fields, and the the size of those uh, that they cover. Right. So in generally, the cells are remapping every time. So there's like no no stretching of the fields. Um, and there's more place cells every time that they double the environment, but the the um, the place cell per area drops, and so um, increasingly they have more than one field in in the big room. You can see that in the lower left plot here, where you see that in the D environment, the average place cell has more than two firing fields, um, and so. You know, right. potentially, if you grow this out to real environments uh, for like roaming rodents on the scale of you know a kilometer or something, you know, there would be many, many, many uh, firing fields, of course. Um, uh, Florian, but... a quick question. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, do they change anything else in the environment or just the dimensions? 
is it the same environment environment but bigger yeah it's i mean they're doing this inside the same giant room right they just like delete borders and right the, i mean it's, you, you can see it here that's that's all that they're doing Yeah, you know what this this experimental setup is is flawed in a fundamental way, which many of these are, in that they have typically these boxes are open to the ceiling, and there's typically environmental clues in the ceiling, the light placements and so on, and so the rat has has an idea whether or not they're in a similar place or a different place. I don't know if that's what they did here, but that's I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. If you look at this, it looks like pretty dark. Uh, well, I don't know. If what the they question, controlled there. The question, they usually open to the ceiling. And right. uh, and when you're open to the ceiling, some some researchers will point out how they've either, they, they may either purposely left that the same or didn't change it to confuse, so it would confuse the rat. And and so uh, very, I don't know, you know, I don't know what this experiment does, but most of these experiments, there is this environmental sense of what's going on. And it makes things confusing and, and they don't really mm. control for it in many experiments. Um, I mean, given how much emphasis they they put on this, I'm pretty sure they controlled for that. You know, I would think so too. But everything I've every time I looked into it, it feels like they have it. I mean, they control it in a way like, yes, we want to make sure that the ceiling lighting fixtures are the same. But mm -hmm. that is, in some sense, it is controlling in the wrong direction. Um, it's right. giving the rat a, a, an external environmental clue that says, "Hey, my walls aren't the only thing that matters here. Um, there's some, you know, I can see this thing in the sky, and it tells me I'm in the same basic place." So I, I'm surprised too, Florian, that they haven't, this hasn't been a bigger issue, but apparently it hasn't been really resolved. Mm. I, I have a question on this one. When, they're, when they go to these bigger rooms, is it the same exact cells are now remapping in the new room or are they, are they finding different cells? So in general, it is true that cells that are active in one environment are likely to be active in the other environment too, but they are remapping, so they're not in the same place. There will also be, as they pointed out, with more space, there are more cells that are, are active and they have, and these cells have on average more firing fields. Um, Did they talk about uh, grid cells at all or is this only place? This is recording CA1, so this is place cell analysis. Right? These, are, these, are, these are tetrodes. Okay, thanks. Um, and so the, the interesting thing is, of course, well, you get more, more, more space, more cells, more, more fields. But um, it turns out that the, the, you have like fewer place fields per unit area to exactly compensate for that. So more place cells each time that you double the area, but the place cell count right per area drops. And increasingly, they have more than one field in the big room. And the place fields become progressively larger, compensating exactly for the reduction in place cell per area, such that the total field coverage per area, like if you sum up the firing fields per area, remain constant across all the environments. So there's some kind of like big, um, you could think of it as like a homeostatic mechanism, right? like a K winner take all. And so that that seems to preserve sort of like the global firing rate of the entire place map. So there's like 10% of place cells that are active at any location. What's quite interesting also is that when you map this out, the, the cell density, so the number of place cells per, per, per area increases near the, near the walls and it decreases in the middle of the room. So in the middle of the room, you're going to have very big firing fields, whereas close to the wall, they tend to be uh, stretched along the wall and sort of like compressed against it. This, um, this makes sense in the, in the idea that a place cells are really, uh, really driven by sensory data. And, um, and when you have a big room, there's really not much local sensory data to base where you are. But when you're near a wall, you have some sort of idea. Mm. Um, you know, the reason I wanted to talk about this topic, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, Florian, there's just some really other big things that you want to discuss, was mm -hmm. I, uh, I was more interested in the nature of how grid cells change in larger spaces. And um, um, uh, I, there's a problem I was working on last night, which we've talked about many times here, and I just I just want to state it, and we can, then, then I'll be done with this. Sure. Um, 
the one of the problems uh, with grid cells, we were talking about, you, you talked about the vote they had. Can, can grid cells be used as a um, um, uh, motor vector planning? I don't forget what term it was. You know, like, can you, can you do a movement vector based on grid cells? You know, I want to okay. get And one of the problems that we've talked about various ways this could be done here at Nementa. And um, one of the problems is that it always requires some sort of memory. Like you have to learn how, if I look at two grid cell representations, like one location, another location, um, the, the location representations are unique, but you can't just calculate the distance and direction. You have to memorize it. Marcus and Tsubata will know what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and one way around that that I was thinking about last night is a very, very, very simple way around that is that we, uh, when we're calculating a movement vector or distance vector, we never want to go through multiple um, um, uh, oscillations or multiple uh, grid cell locations. That, is, that the system works fine as long as you don't, you're not counting on the grid cell being grid-like. You know, if the, if the next grid cell location was far away, uh, this, uh, very ah. well, then, then the calculations come out pretty simple, you know, and so. Right. So in the local neighborhood, the grid cell is a place cell. Uh, well, it's not a place cell, but it can be used to calculate a distance in a vector, uh, a distance vector. And so we always show grid cells like here's a box that the rat is in and look at all the places it's oscillating. It, it, it becomes active in this box. Well, if you have a grid cell representation of a location, of a space like that, you can't calculate a, a distance vector. Um, but in reality, that may be, we, we may be thinking about it wrong. Maybe what's going on is we know that grid cells exist at very different scales. The different modules have different scales. And maybe what, the, what what's going on is in, in a small environment, a very small environment, I'm trying to be very precise in, in calculating my distances, I would use a grid cell representation where I would unlikely have a second grid cell um, a point within that environment. And if I go to a larger space, I would use another grid cell uh, module that is also unlikely to have a second one in that space. And, that, and, and we've always been thinking like, oh no, they're gonna be, if you just look at an individual grid cell of one grid cell module, it may be, it may be tessellated within an environment, but the, but the animal may not be using that grid cell module to calculate uh, distance. It may be using a different grid cell module where you wouldn't see the tessellation. So the experimental bias is to find these tessellations of grid cells. Well, you'll find them, but you may be looking at a grid cell module that is not being used at that point uh, for calculating uh, direction and distance. So when you show me this, this is the reason I wanted to talk about this because I was interested in they were showing what would happen with large spaces, uh, specifically with grid cells, but when we, it's only about place cells and it's not as interesting. So it's interesting, mm -hmm. that's interesting. So anyway, that's what I wanted to look at this for. Unless you have something else to say, we can go talk about bats. Right, cool, all right. Um, no, I, I, I don't think I have something specific to say about that. Um, so looking at bats, um, right? Uh, Egyptian uh, fruit bats, if I'm right, right? Um, so, um, so Nahum was there and he was talking about uh, large scale space and fruit bats. So fruit bats are living in, in big environments by necessity, I mean, they fly. And so the question that he was trying to answer was, uh, well, what about flying bats with, you know, electrodes in their head in large environments? How would you do that? Obviously, it's a tricky thing for like the whole telemetry kind of a thing, how to pick up the signal and how to have like mobile um you know, units that would send that out. All of that needs to be wireless. Obviously, it's not as easy as in as in rodents. And so, um, but they managed something. And so that he was uh, like having them fly in a 200 meter tunnel with landmarks. So a, a, a big tunnel. And the one cool thing about bats is that bats, um, let me show one of these bats here. Um, they love to fly. So unlike the uh, rodents where you always have to like drop food in random locations to make them move, uh, you often like, you don't even like, you can, you give them some food rewards at the end of the tunnels, but they, they often like even just nibble a little bit. They just love flying. Like they don't even care much for the food reward. Um, and so they have a, have a flight speed that is pretty fixed at well, something like eight meters a second or so. So that varies rather little. And so then they have like spike rusters from what is uh, like dorsal, um, uh, like CA1, um, with separate fields for each direction. So it turns out when the 
when the when you reverse course like lots in some sense we've seen that with rodents already that in linear track tasks often the map in one direction is not consistent with the map in the other direction um so the so the place fields are different depending on which direction the the bats are flying through that tunnel they did different experiments with like uh, different landmarks and different places and like trying to remove them and so on uh, I don't like as far as I understood that didn't make too much of a difference. Um, but of course, they do have like clustering of place fields near reward locations and near um, like these wall segments where they're allowed to rest. Hey, Flo. Mm -hmm. I'm still just seeing the photograph of uh, the. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. We should move here. Um, so then you're trying to build like these firing maps in uh, in 3D and you get something like um something like you know up to 20 fields per per you know tunnel direction that's like a low yield obviously compared to what we're nowadays used to with like these new pixel probes that record hundreds of you know head directions and grid cells and 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 place cells uh, but it's you know the best we can do technologically with like these mobile um mobile things right the picture on the left here doesn't imply a tunnel. It implies like a box. No, no, it's a, that that's a volume section, right? Is that like and one? So, that's one section of the tunnel. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's a that's a section of the tunnel essentially. And so, uh, in analyzing the, the the data, they concluded that um, unlike the theoretical predictions, this is not like the what is the the hpc or the F, fcc the these like these optimal two packings that exist for 3d space um and it's not explained by the variability in flight speed because the flight speed is actually like very constant and so um so they recruited uh misha Zodix to answer um not just like you know like um so well, this is not, you know, spatially maximally compact, but like, what is there in terms of structure? And the most other important finding of, of this uh, was sorry, that... I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to get too confused here. Are they looking at what we would call place cells or grid cells? Yeah, this is CA1, so these are place no, cells. These right. are place cells. And, right. and so I, I, no one ever talks about place cells being packed optimally. You might talk about grid cells being packed optimally. Oh, I see. Um, no, actually, I'm I'm sorry. I stand corrected. This is these are MEC recordings. Okay, so no. 20, twenty to thirty percent of the multi-field neurons in MEC are three D okay. grid so cells. These are what we would call grid cells, and they're right. showing that if you go back to the next picture, the one you just showed a moment, right. the gold balls or whatever, um, right. they're pretty well packed in there. Uh, you're saying they're just not, I they're just not perfectly packed. Is that the idea? Yeah. So, like, there's different ways to do to do the math on that. Um, like to to look at for example the 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 interfield distance in a perfect grid that interfield distance is one narrow spike at the grid interval that is not the case here as you can see the interfield distance has some distribution i'm sorry is this the interfield distance of a single cell when it fires and when it fires again yeah or that's how i understand this plot yes so let me just look at those numbers there. So a, a single grid cell, the one up here right there, is saying uh, might fire um, at every 1.3 meters or something like that. So right, but it varies. It might just be half a meter, or it might be almost two meters sometimes. Uh -huh. So that is not a maximally compact grid. Um, so, so it seems to be sort of like a multi-scale, um, multi-scale fields of sorts. Um, you know, this goes back to the point I made earlier, um, where I was saying perhaps grid cells really aren't grid cells; uh, they're just this uh, projection of something else. So, I, I still really like the idea of a whole bunch of one D. Um, I'm still working on that idea, a bunch of one D sort of orientation mini columns. And so everything would be thought about in these one dimensions, and then somehow that gets projected down in the 2D. And so it's not clear, it's totally unclear what, you know, even what I just said is not clear, but, but it's not clear to me that I would expect to see some sort of regular, um, uh, you know, uh, 3D or 2D array of these things. I just, it's not clear at all mm -hmm. to me. Um, I, yeah, I, 
I would guess that uh, that the big factor here, and this is compatible with what you said, and also something Flo said earlier, uh, a big a big factor here is um, every every grid cell experiment ever, and essentially involves dropping uh, dropping treats randomly throughout the environment, causing the animal to explore that environment using a random walk. Uh, policy essentially it walks around randomly when it when it randomly explores the space uniformly you get really nice grids uh but but here that's not what's going on it's it might be somewhat close to random but like but uh even even with rat experiments when you do alternate experiments where they're running landmark to landmark to landmark you lose the pretty yeah. grids they're, they they go away uh and this is just something similar to that so maybe right. underlying there are these nice 1d metric things underneath and the grid cells are somehow doing a readout of those. And if you're not random walking in a nice way, uh, then you get something messy like this. That's a good observation. That's right. So um, so they, they looked at these fields and they concluded it's it's th these are not columns, there's no elongation, they're like you know, reasonably circular fields. Um, and um, so they had, you know, a bunch of candidates like 66 cells that had more than 10 stable fields. And so they did base their analysis on that. And so measuring field distances, um, they have, you know, a narrow distribution, as you can see from, from this example cell here, right? Um, but it's clearly not FCP or H HCP um, uh, fit, like these maximally compact spatial packings that exist. Um, you can also look at that of like of the distribution of angles between um, between neighboring uh, grid fields, and that's also not compatible with with maximum packing of any sorts. But there is clearly some local order in the sense of um, that the you know it's not optimal like a like a beehive grid, right? But you do have local order, so. So it, it might not be perfectly hexagonal, and the orientations are not preserved throughout this grid, right? Um, but they're still uh, like local distances are, you know, uh, are, are narrowly bunched, right, within a small range. You know, this goes back to the point I was making earlier that if we assume a bat has multiple grid cell modules of different scales, the experimental bias here would be to find cells that repeat within this experimental uh, apparatus. And so they're gonna look for smaller grid scales that have a lot of you know, the cell based part, that's what they're looking for. But in reality, perhaps not, uh, perhaps what the animal is using to navigate long distance is a different grid cell module, we wouldn't be seeing much repetition at all. And so yeah. that, that would be consistent with, it's consistent in a small environment because that's where we, these cells may be, rep, may be there for small environments, and in a small environment, uh, like the bat is eating from a flower or something like that, the precision where the bat has to be mm -hmm. in time has to be pretty precise. So that these these cells could be working in small environments, but they're looking at them when the rat's flying through this long tunnel, and they at, at that distances are not being used. They're just they're not they're not important. Right. Yeah, that was essentially the argument that um, I, I think he mentioned that like Misha Sodix did some analysis on on these multi-scale, like the play cells, so the one that they had in CA1. And you made exactly that argument that if your living environment is very large, it is in some sense optimal to have very big and very small fields and intermixed and to, to not impose uh, sort of like this, um, you know, this one scale structure. Um, and that maybe that goes hand in hand with having a, a, a local packing in the grid cells. Lorian, did uh, they mention, uh, did they do any uh, tracking analysis to say how regular the pattern of flight was through that tunnel? What do you mean, regular pattern of flight? Uh, what I, I, I had an incident a, a number of years ago where a bat uh, got trapped in a house I was staying in. And Ooh. it was uh, basically flying between two rooms. And as long as you didn't stand in the path of where the bat was flying, it repeated the pattern over and over and over again. It wasn't like exploring the space. It was like bounce. It was getting, you know, the signals back saying, this is the best place to avoid collision that I can fly. So I'm just wondering how much, how regular this pattern was that when they're flying up and down the tunnel. 
Yeah, I, I can't I can't answer that. I I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think I remember like a picture with like uh, trajectories or something, and but I don't know if that was like multiple trials or one or so. So I honestly can't answer that. Um, what I meant to uh, mention the um, like the question was asked whether there is like a dorsal ventral gradient, and the, obviously because they have very small yields, they can't say that with certainty. Um, like there's some indications that the, the grids, you know, might scale also ventrally, but uh, there's not enough data to say that with, with certainty. And so uh, what they did essentially to try to explain the grid cell data is they had just I, I like say different... One more time. This, this yeah. is a fascinating thing. You know, the, the reason um, grid cells were not discovered uh, in the O'Keefe lab, and O'Keefe said this, is because... Um, they didn't go to big enough environments where the repetition of the grid cell uh, occurred. And right. so, uh, and here again, the experimental bias may be like, well, we didn't see any of these other scales because they wouldn't look grid-like. The, right. Again, the rat, the bat may be using these other grid cell modules where the important grid cell module at this point in time, you're not seeing this repetition. And right. so they're gonna go look for the ones that get the most repetition. And then, and then yeah. they say, okay, these are grid cells. We may have been all thinking about this incorrectly. Um, it's a very simple mm. twist, but I, I, once again, reminded me that experimental bias might have been affected this. Yeah, yeah that's that's interesting. Um, what what I like asked him uh, after the presentation is, of course, given that hybrid models are are on my mind and also to interference, and it is exactly the regularity of theta that imposes the the the, the perfect regularity of the uh, of of the grid in a in, a, in an oscillatory interference model. What about theta in bats? And it turns out um, there is um, reliable precession, but there is no global theta. So there's a local field potential signal that you can read out that goes, you know, up and down. And there is signatures of precession where the, the, the cell firing will precess with respect to that global LFP signal. But that global LFP signal is not a perfect regular um, uh, oscillation. So it just goes up and down more irregularly than what you see in the very nice theta that you get in rodents. And so they're, they're they're seeing a theta signal, but its its frequency is varying. Exactly. Now remember the hypothesis I have about this is that again just a hypothesis is that um, the scale of the global theta would change with um, or the, the, the rate of the global theta would change with um, it, it would it would be a way of, of the animal scaling spaces or scaling uh, time in some portion. Right. Scaling. And so under that scenario, uh, I, I don't know what that means. I'm just saying that the idea that theta has to be consistent all the time is, is not necessarily true. It could be working just the way we think it is, but it could be the way that the animal is now thinking longer distance or shorter distance or attending something further away or something, something short. Um, you know, the, a rat presumably attends to different things. It, it text, detects with its sonar. And so if you just imagine it being like a visual system and the rat is sort of like attending to things far away, attending to close up, and I, it, the, the theta signal could be scaling re relative to that and still work the way we think it does. Well, another thing that it occurs to me is that if the, uh, since the bat spends so much of its time flying, there is no, unless it's landed, which is a kind of not a very rich space for it, there, he can't just hold position in midair or typically doesn't he's always moving so right. how much of this this locked in theta frequency is based upon the fact that a rat can remain still and still have this thing to displace back and forth if the environment is continually changing all the time then it, it gets used probably gets used for something else is it's being the dominant <laughs> thing all right i mean there are um talking about sort of, you know, what remains constant, right, would then be the, the, the things like head direction. And so there are clear indications of head direction cells, and they tend to have uh, like differential encoding for the, the, the azimuth and the, what is it, the pitch. Um, so there's different conjunctions of that. So that's kind of what you would expect. So the actual like 3D head direction cells, those do exist. 
And those would, of course, you know, then stay more constant because you're flying at a certain trajectory um, as opposed to um, everything else, right? The, the grids and the places that are flying by fast, as you point out. All right, um, unless there's more questions on that, um, I would move on, on to, you know, slightly more theoretical considerations um, with um, work by Dori Dedekman who was talking about the chicken and egg problem of grid cells and place cells. Um, so like what, what comes first, right? Are, are grid cells driving place cells or are place cells driving grid cells? There's of course lots of different papers who advance different notions of that and experimental evidence in, in either direction. Um, the, the canonical view says that, well, there's a couple of things, right? One is the continuous attractor neural network. They do path integration through velocity inputs. And then place cells get formed from, from grid cells. That's what we were thinking like, you know, like maybe five years ago. Um, and there's lots of evidence for the canonical view um, as like all these studies obviously point out, uh, particular intercellular data, but there's problems. So for example, the grid cells, if you, if you uh, silence hippocampus, right, the grid cells get, get abolished. Um, so even though some spike relationships like get uh, get uh, preserved apparently, um, developmentally apparently grid cells appear after place cells. So like the environmental well, the environmental cues tend to be sort of like easier to learn. Maybe I have no idea um, before you develop that grid. So that's an argument for people who think about grid cells being eigenvectors of the state transition space. Um, then there's, um, he was saying that like we haven't found velocity vector cells as would be needed for like a perfectly functional CAN network to do all the navigation stuff. Um, but that was actually met by uh, different kinds of objections. One was uh, Charlotte Bocara, who's uh, also NTNU. She's actually starting a new group there who uh, pointed out in her talk that she's found like, you know, some conjunctive cells that might qualify for that. Um, um, so that's an interesting question. And of course, I pointed out that in the hybrid grid cell model implementations, um, like we kind of have you covered, right? I mean, the, the, the well dated I'll, you know, the described cells in the interior thalamus, well, they kind of do that because they're both speed modulated and head modulated, just not with firing rates as people would like in the traditional CAN model, but instead by having a theta modulation, a theta frequency that goes up linearly with speed and has a cosine directional direction, uh, cosine directional tuning on top of it, right? So it's a change in theta frequency rather than firing rate per se. I have, I have a question, uh, uh, it's just in these velocity vector cells are needed by the CAN model. Um, aren't velocity vector cells also needed by the by the uh, hybrid model, not to move the can, but to control the oscillation frequency, the voltage controlled oscillators? Isn't it? Also, don't you also need that? Uh, I mean, uh, it depends on what you want to do, right? Because like the 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 broader point I was trying to make is that the the oscillatory interference model presumes that the input cells, like these VCOs are already integrated direction and speed. So that's not a vector in itself, but it's the basis for that. Well, and it's in that, one how, cell. How, so they're not separate speed cells and head that, direction cells. They're not separate, but it is a, it is a uh, velocity direction. It's a, it's a movement vector. I mean, if I have a cell yeah. that it represents movement in one direction and it, its speed of Firing wouldn't that be a wouldn't that be a, a velocity vector cell? Yeah, I mean that that's how I think about these cells that well they had all described. Yeah, because you know in the model I've been promoting recently, where the mini columns represent a one D orientation, and as I've argued that that what what Hubel and Beesel classically described as you know orientation cells with a with a uh, a directional preference. Um, those are velocity vector cells. It's the velocity in that. It's the velocity in that particular uh, um, 1D space. So I, don't, I guess I didn't understand why velocity vector cells are needed for CAN, but not for the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. uh, Florian, uh, do you think these are the, the only options? Uh, do you? I mean, can they be encoding? completely different things and then they just error correct one another through the recurrent connections? 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yes. Uh, I mean, sure. There's, I, I think there's lots of different ways to to think about this, right? And the the zoo of models that we're now getting for functional grid cell place cell interaction, right, is is exploring much of that. Um, like, do we actually need explicit representations for all of these things? Uh, that's a that's a really good question. So maybe we're also like asking too much, and you know. Um, you know, just because you can find cells that are conjunctive and have all of the properties you might want, uh, sort of does not mean that that is sort of like the principal mechanism by which everything gets done. Um, yeah. I think, Lucas, your your, uh, your observation is the right one in my mind, um, and I'm surprised that people have this idea that one has to drive the other. Um, uh, and I've described. In fact, I even got this into the book, which I sent out yesterday. That, you know, you can have these two representations. One can be driven primarily by sensory data, meaning like what is observed here, and the other can be driven primarily by you know a metric that's driven by some sort of motor signal, whether that's motor signal is coming from an afferent, a reafferent, or if it's coming from the sensory stream itself. But but you're right that they you know they're sort of two independent ways of representing space. One is sensory driven, and one's motor driven, and they they both can inform the other. It's it's the, it's not like one always drives the other. And the way I've always viewed it is the sensory data can impose a location. If I if I look around and see where I am, then I will know where I am. So it can it, a sensory data can be a driver, um, and a location data like if I know where I am should be a predictive of what I'm going to see. It, it, it isn't. Uh, it doesn't drive me to see something, but it predicts I'm going to see something. So I would view the interaction between play cells and grid cells is not. They're both. It's both inform the other, and they're separate, like you said. But one can be a driver and one can be a predictive signal. That seems to be, to me, it's a guess, but it seems to be the most copacetic explanation for this. Um, and so I'm surprised people keep coming thinking about it as like one's, one's, one's the, 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 the chicken and one's the egg that's in God. Um, yeah. Uh. So sure. I mean, like I mean, increasingly, like we we don't think of it as a chicken and egg problem. It's just a way of, you know, a hyper, hyper, like, of uh, how do you say, like extending a debate to its extremes, right? To test this. I mean, there, there's increasingly all these people, right? Like like Burak, who's thinking about, you know, like the functional consequences of all these different couplings, and people are thinking about it in bidirectional ways. But of course, it's also true that in many ways, like the, the, you know, some people like Ilafit are talking about like the capacity of play cells as derived from grid cells, right? And other people are thinking the, exactly the other way around. They're thinking like Neil Burgess, um, like, look, the grid cells are the eigenvectors of the state space transition matrix as spanned by, by play cells. And so, it, the, that doesn't mean that any of these views are incompatible. It's just people are exploring different angles on this. And of course, as people who analyze the microcircuits know, these areas are densely bidirectionally interconnected through various direct and indirect pathways. Although I was surprised how indirect the connection from hippocampus to the grid cells is, as I found out in Menno Witter's talk. Um, We've talked about this a lot in the cortex where these things be occurring. And there's these two sets of bidirectional connections between layer six in layer four and layer six B and layer five, I think it was, I can't remember now. Um, yeah. Very unique, they're bi-directional, they they're very suggestive of this um, in the cortex. I don't know about the hip, that would be interesting to do to get a review of what's going on in the hip, in the, between the hippocampus and the uh, interorion cortex. As you said, I've heard that, and Marcus, you said that they're very highly interconnected, but you just said a moment ago, boring, there was some sort of indirect, which is, I didn't know that. Hmm. Uh, w one quick time check. It's now eleven seventeen. I think Jeff, you said you wanted to leave at eleven thirty. Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, well, I, I so, was said eleven fifteen because I have something I want to do at eleven thirty. So um, okay. But, so, but we, yeah, if we could wrap up, I, well, you don't have to wrap up, but I'm going to have to drop out soon. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll wrap up this part of the Doradetic Man talk, uh, which is actually very good because it was just trying to rope everybody in. I mean, the 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 title is just you know polemic. Um, and so, um, so I, I asked him these questions, right? About like, what about you know vectors in an oscillatory interference model? And he was he was like very very open to that. And I, I pointed out that like it, like a really superior models, right? Of of grid cells, uh, like 
would ideally explain more than just the canonical cells, right? So, it, so including cells that are ugly and including cells that are not perfect grid cells, like border cells and whatnot. And just mention that, of course, you know, like a hybrid model can produce pr pretty much all of these um, just by dropping different um, different components, right? You get band cells and and and, and that all that jazz. Um, uh, but like, so while the oscillatory interference model does not seem to be on everybody's mind, uh, at least, you know, people are still open to that. I was a little bit surprised how little talk there was about like theta are, precision. Are you saying, and are you saying that, about that in these models? Are you saying that people are sort of, uh, they're not thinking about this at all, or they're really sort of settled on the CAN model? I, I think like, I mean, like the, the, the CAN approach is like driving most of, most people's thinking about this. I asked Neil, Neil Burgess himself about that. There was like a coffee break after this meeting. Um, uh, and so that the, like he, he kind of explains to me that like, um, you know, like what would be necessary to really prove this is exactly what you've been thinking of, Jeff, right? You would ideally want to record from the different dendrites um, while you will have a, you know, freely behaving rodent. And so that's a little bit tricky, but it might be able to do it with like uh, with with two photon if you had you know really good resolution. And so you would need a two DVR environment with a prism into uh, entorhinal cortex. And so so yeah. So Neil, Neil mentioned he's like thinking of setting that up, but he's like he's staying some kind of like quiet until then, because unless you prove like these underlying premises of the oscillatory interference model it might be a little bit hard to sort of like push push this idea for the entire field because people are just so drawn to all these different maps yeah. and the well, rate so, codes. What's was so funny about this is, you remember, I've told this story many times, when, when Hasselmoff saw the tank image, I showed it to him, and and he, he just like burst into his eyeballs, like opened up, and he said, that eliminates the CAN model. This is not possible in the CAN model. And I'm just surprised that other people, you know, why, why, you know, there's so many problems with the CAM model and it's, and we've got data which sort of disproves it. I'm just surprised mm -hmm. people are sticking with that. And, and that's why it seemed to me like the, the hybrid model that you, you presented that paper, that seems to me, it's just so obvious. It seems to be right. I, I know people don't like it when I say that word obvious, but it seems right. to me. So I, I'm just surprised they're still sticking with the CAM model. Yeah. I mean, there's many ways to overcome the problems of the CAM model if you allow for, you know, for example, play cell, grid cell interactions, right? And you think smartly about the coupling between between the two. Yeah, so. but, but that's but you can't overcome the problems that the, what tank paper showed is that the the bumps of the can the bumps of the uh, of activity in the grid cells are there's not enough cells around them, not even right. close to make yeah. the work. And that's what that's what Hasselmo's observation was. It says that's not possible. I don't. I haven't heard of an argument that says you can overcome that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a. I mean, that that would be a great question to 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 pose to people directly. I did not ask that question. Uh, I I did ask Neil about like you know the more direct verification of the hybrid model, which would be you know recording from dendrites um, uh, of the same neuron, right? To to show that there is in fact oscillatory interference. Um, yeah. Anyway. It's amazing to me how how stuck people get on their ways, and and um, you know it, it's sort of like they they stick to their their argument and they they don't seem to really want to try to find what's wrong with it. Well, you should do a talk of the death of the can model then. <laughs> I mean, it's not like all the aspects of the can model are wrong, right? There's clearly some centers around inhibition. Yeah, yeah. It, like, the hybrid model solves that. That's the point. It was, that's yeah. like. Accept that. Yeah, I know. I know. If it was up to me, we'd be only talking about that, like yeah, how the hybrid model, you know, can be made better. And you know, that seems to be we should just answer. rewind and rewatch all your talks, Florian, from a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, everybody, just go rewind. Watch the talks from a month ago. Uh, yeah. We talked about that. <laughs> yeah, I can't just tell that to people. Um, Anyways, um, I don't know if we're going to let Jeff go now and if you guys want to continue or if we continue at this, you know, some other time. Um, so I have a generic question again, uh, just cosine in general. Last year and the year before, there were a lot of uh, talks on kind of machine learning and deep learning and relationships to neuroscience. Uh, mm -hmm. Were there any talks like that that you noticed? Um, yeah. 
Um, a couple. So obviously, um, uh, uh, Surya Ganguly obviously talked about that. Uh, VJ, what's his name? Balasubraman something, uh, long name. Um, uh, Kim Stachenfeld talked a bit about that. So there's a couple different talks. I, I don't have all of the pictures of these talks in this um, in this Prezi yet, so I can't exactly show you now. But uh, maybe next time we talk about that, we can we can focus a bit on on the part that touch on on machine learning. Sure. Yes, there there are a couple, not a lot, but you know, some three three or four talks in that direction. So, okay, so now that's interesting by itself because I think last couple of years there were a lot more. Um, yeah, it, it seems overall, I mean, people are thinking a lot about sort of functional grid cell place interaction. So people are interested in building more models of that, but there was not a lot of talk. I mean, maybe it was also because it was the dedicated grid cell workshop, maybe. Yes, yeah, so I guess my question is not restricted to the workshop, just the yeah. full conference. Oh, cosine overall. Yeah, I'm sure there must have been quite a bit more. I mean, in terms of posters, what I saw quite a bit and also during the conference itself, is lots of neuroscientists trying out recurrent neural networks um, and and sort of trying to link them to different things that they observe in their experimental data. And a couple of talks that were essentially aimed at lowering the, the, the fear thresholds of, I guess, traditional experimental neuroscientists to come on, try out these you know, machine learning tools. It's not as hard anymore to do it. There's all these standard libraries. So. Um, I think there's an outreach uh, going on. Yeah, is there anything, was there anything in the other direction where kind of neuroscience information might be used to improve machine learning models? I have seen no such thing. Okay. Just um, yeah, I mean, that would be really cool to see. That would like complete the Numenta circle. That would be where we are at home. Um, but no, uh, I have... I mean, it doesn't mean that nothing like that happened, but I have seen nothing in, in that direction. Okay, yeah, that's pretty consistent. I mean, there was nothing last year on that in that direction and very little in general mm. anywhere. I think. That was that's kind of the unfortunate thing about this uh, co uh, Cosmic Harbor Lab conference thing. Yeah. That was sort of the whole intent of that. Um, yeah. I I'm gonna step out here. I, I'm actually finding, I mean, I'm finding a lot of useful information in the stuff you're presenting. And so um, I would like to continue this if there are two out of interesting things to talk about. Yeah, uh, sure. My, my recommendation, uh, you guys can continue on or not. I, if you find something interesting, just send me a note about the paper. Um, but, um, or you could just say, we'll pick it up again um, on Monday or um, if we want to just stick to the Monday, Wednesday schedule. Um, right. And uh, we'll just do, do some more of this then. I'm, I'm finding it useful. So, um, I don't know. We don't have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off now, so that's okay. Yeah. Bye, Jeff. All right. Bye now. Thanks. Again. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm fine with um, you know picking this up some other time, or maybe you have like questions about any of these people on this list. Um, I don't know. What do you guys feel like? Let's continue another time. All right. I mean, we are yeah. like at an hour and a half almost. So exactly. It's been, it's been a while. So yeah. I think uh, continuing at cool. another time would be great. Um, did, yeah. I, did I understand you? Think... Yeah, go ahead. Did I understand you correctly that you would like to hear a little bit more about sort of the, the, the perspective that some of the machine learning people like Sarah Ganguly and, and Kim Stachenfeld like were bringing? Like it, I mean, maybe maybe a little bit. It might be good to touch mm -hmm. on it. I'm primarily interested in you know kind of the other direction of whether neuroscience can impact machine learning. I think right. there's there's tons of stuff going from machine learning to neuroscience, and I can yeah. easily see how that's important. Um, but uh, I'm more interested in the other direction, obviously. Mm. Um, but so if you yeah, if you want to do a quick brief review of that stuff, that would be great. Yeah. yeah, I'm just uh, trying to think a little bit what we're going to do next time, right? Because there's lots to yeah. talk about. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like the focus you have here. I'm more interested in the experimental data, really, mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to understand some of these interesting properties right. uh, that you presented. So I, I'm kind of surprised there are, uh, I think you mentioned this last time, there were, you didn't see as many models, of, as much modeling work. Um, yeah. Really supposed to be the focus of cosine. Um, yeah. So. I, I get a sense though that there's a lot of people who are like thinking about, oh wow, now we have all this, you know, dense recordings and interactions. Now we need a model. So, um, but yeah, I mean, 
there mm-hmm. are some that are dead like thinking about it you know very dedicated like you know i don't know travis and certainly burak and neil burgess they they're, they're thinking about putting models around all of these things but it, that's not the majority of the people who were there um for sure yeah and and you and this is specific to the workshop itself the grid cell workshop yeah yeah of yeah. course i mean i can't speak much to the rest of the conference since mm-hmm. i spent the entirety of my time you know uh with, uh, with uh, at least at the workshops with with uh, grid cell people and Typing lots and lots of no stuff. <laughs> cool. Thank right. you. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a productive day. Thank you, Flo. I'm going to stop the stream now. Thanks, everybody, for watching.